Um, and uh, while they're both tasty fruit, uh, we want to make sure we're getting the right comparison. And this bill's trying to do that. Uh, there is some significant transparency pieces in there. Um, at the same time, we don't want to get into economic voyeurism. Um, and the bill is, as modified, I think we'll, we'll try and balance that line. Uh, we've been working with the House to try and avoid an extensive conference process, but I do anticipate we'll have to have a conference process on it. Uh, back to the budget bill, there's, um, I think there's some opposition to some insurance subrogation language change that you uh, inserted into the, into the bill. Um, sites had made a reference to it on the, on the House floor speech. Did you insert it? And if so, are you asking me or are you asking me? No, it's an amendment by one of the members. I usually don't go into that. Uh, and you're aware of that. Um, but the short answer is, is it tries to deal with something that's been out there since at least 2005. Uh, it is a fair provision that recognizes the rights of insurers um, and says essentially we're going to balance the recovery between insurers and insurers uh, when the insured, the individuals, Bob and Betty Buckeye, if you would, aren't made whole from their recovery from a third party. Um, look, insurance companies uh, have been putting provisions in their contracts that allow them to step to the head of the line. Let me give you an example. Uh, somebody recovers $100 from a third party, and the insurance company says, that's nice, uh, your damages might be $500, but we're going to take all $100. You had to pay $30 to recover that $100. Sorry about your luck, you had to pay to recover our money. Um, if it's only $100, people can live with that. But when you're talking about people with life-changing injuries, okay, somebody who was in a coma for three months, somebody who was in a situation to where they were hit by an uninsured motorist, and they paid uninsured motorist coverage insurance, and that uninsured motorist coverage insurance receipt that they've got for literally multi-million dollars in lifetime damages, having to be cared for by their mom and dad for the rest of their life, now goes to pay a health insurance company when they paid health insurance premiums for that benefit, instead of helping care for them for the rest of their life. That's the kind of thing we did by putting the subrogation provision in, by balancing the total damages against just that component that's part of the subrogating and doing a pro rata based on the total recovery. And so that issue had been around since 2005 when the Supreme Court made an uh, interesting ruling, um, and uh, this tries to balance that playing field. Um, it's very pro-consumer uh, and basically says uh, we're going to balance it, and ultimately uh, it is language that's very similar to what Indiana does, and I don't know that Indiana would be ever be called an anti-business state or an anti-insurance state. But that tells you a lot about what it does. Is this something that trial attorneys want? Uh, it's something that a lot of people ask for. Question. Um, are you planning to come back next week to work on any bills or the resolution on monopolies, for example? Uh, we anticipate being here next Tuesday. You do. Uh, what's on the agenda for that? Uh, it's still being developed. Monopoly. We have an interest in working on how HDR4, I believe. Yeah. Yes. What else? Uh, uh, we'll we'll see what else. Depends on what they send us. All right. Mm -hmm. Depends on what we send them. Do you, any, okay. do you anticipate any overrides on Tuesday of any line item veto? Depends on what's vetoed. I haven't seen the veto list. Okay. You tell me the veto list, Laura. I, I, I I'll, I'll tell you where either. we're going to go. <laughs> Uh, on K-12, how will the shift of $150 million in uh, school technology funding, how will that affect student readiness uh, in the 20% Well, it, it does change. The, the It went to a different area of funding, and the technology funding switch, by its very nature, changes the uh, role of who's going to get the money. But uh, ultimately, we, we made the decision that, look, we want to get money to kids, and uh, moving that out of technology funds still gets money to kids. Uh, it changes the distribution and how the money comes through. That went to the capacity aid. Yes. Okay. And any any thoughts on the Supreme Court ruling today on uh, the, the uh, Obamacare? Uh, uh, you know, as a lawyer, I respect the authority of the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, even when I don't agree with him. I'm not sure how you can read uh, the law that was passed in a haste by Congress and just ignore the words. But I haven't read the opinion, so I need to do that. I heard Justice Scalia wrote a heck of a good dissent. Yes. Interesting. Like, yeah. I haven't I haven't read it. I'm just going on what I've been told. And can you speak to what is in the is there anything in the budget that that dovetails off of what they that ruling today? I know there was I believe there was a provision in there in case they ruled the other way. Is there anything in there that that kicks in because they they upheld it? No. As it relates to the insurance director being able to I think 
uh, Senator Apoff has talked, to, uh, talked a little bit about that. Um, do you anticipate that the state would seek this waiver to get out of the mandates? Well, look, I mean, the mandates are still there, and so it changes the whole dynamic of that. Look, I hope at some point that uh, the federal government reverses themselves on the operation of this program and they let us operate under compacts or other consortiums to provide health care that actually reduces the cost. But as long as we're on a top-down federal government knows best program, uh, I think we're going to continue to see costs go up and inefficiencies being forced on the state. The other option is the federal government can just do what many, including most of our Republican delegation in Congress have asked for, is to block grant back to the states, Medicaid dollars, and let us devise a system that operates for the benefit of Ohio at less cost and, and more efficiency. Until they do that, um, we're going to be constrained into a system that dictates uh, and ties our hands um, and doesn't allow us to generate true Ohio-based solutions. You said you anticipate going to conference on charter yes. stuff. Is that going to happen in the next 24 hours or is something you're doing after summer recess? No, we're, we anticipate having that bill done before we go home. But look, I also set dates in July. Um, you know, I'm not trying to wreck your summer vacations, but right now we, I think, are looking at the third week of July to have come back and have session. And it depends on whether we need it. So the bill that you're, I'm sorry, the bill that you're coming back to do after the break is, is what bill? The charter bill is what's No, the we're number? anticipating the charter bill will be done before we leave on July 1st. I'm sorry, today. The, you're coming oh, back at 545 to yes. do two bills. One bill. of them is the BWC budget, the yeah, other is. We're going to, yeah, we're going to retake the BWC budget and uh, we anticipate adding an amendment to the BWC budget to fix something that was omitted or, or done incorrectly in the conference. Um, and the second is the... Uh, Charter Transparency Bill. Does that admission have to do with PTSD? It does not. Okay. What does it have to do with? Um, it has to do with hospital transparency. So this would do what for the hospital? Just wait and you'll get to hear it. All right. If I gave you the all.